Welcome back, everyone. On today's episode of The Joseph Carlson Show, I finally added another company to the portfolio. The business I decided to add to my roster of companies is Moody's. I started with a $5,000 position. Moody's is the companionship duopoly with S&P Global in global credit ratings. But they do much more than that. Around 50% of Moody's revenue is a highly profitable subscription business called Moody's Analytics. So in today's episode, we'll be going over Moody's, why I added this company to my portfolio. Why is it a con- compounding machine. And what does the valuation and future free cash flow expectations look like? We'll be going over all of it in this episode. Now, we also have a lot of other news to get to. Importantly, we had news that Boeing has run into more trouble. We know Boeing had trouble with two 747 Maxes crashing within six months of each other. Now, only a few years later, a section of the plane as big as a door fell off during the flight. So they're flying with a huge section of the plane missing. And the problem even continues where it doesn't seem like it's a one-off with just that plane. Of course, they did inspections on other Boeing planes and they found that there's more loose parts on the MAX 9 jets. So what is going on here? We have Boeing planes that are literally falling apart mid-flight. We'll also be addressing an important question from Wall Street Bets. Is it insider trading if I bought Boeing puts while I'm inside the wrecked airplane? We'll be looking at the answer of this question later. Now at Honda CES, Honda teased a couple new concept cars. One of them's called the Space Hub. The other's called the Saloon. We'll be looking at these new EV concepts. So obviously we have a lot to get to in this episode. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Now, first of all, we'll start off with my new addition to the portfolio. What I'm looking for when I'm looking for new investments is I'm looking for companies that can add to my portfolio without making my portfolio worse and that is difficult to do. We know the type of companies that I own. I own companies that are exceedingly high quality. Many of them are the best companies in the world. Companies like Microsoft and Apple are heavily weighted in my portfolio, much more than the S&P 500 or even the QQQ. I've invested in companies like Costco for a number of years that have done exceptionally well, provided a lot of alpha because of the qualities of these companies. These are in a category of their own. So every time I'm doing analysis on different companies that are potentially additions to my portfolio, the problem I keep coming back to is they're simply worse than what I already own. It's very difficult to find a company of this caliber, ones like S&P Global, MasterCard, and Intuit. These globally diversified, high returns on capital assets that have incredible reach, incredible moats, they're incredibly profitable. It's simply difficult to beat these companies that I already have. The big thing I wanna avoid is adding companies that are worse than what I already own. This is a term that Peter Lynch called diversification. It's when you add new additional holdings to your portfolio that are lower quality than what you already own. Or companies can do this as well. If a company acquires another company that's worse than what it already has, that is diversification. Diversification would lower the overall quality of my portfolio. And as you know, I'm trying to do the exact opposite. I wanna increase the overall quality of my portfolio. So over the past couple of months, I've been studying the characteristics of what makes really good companies, what makes them above the fold. I have a list of companies that I all think are very high quality. Many of them I own, some of them I don't. But I'm constantly reviewing a watch list of potential companies that I may wanna add in the future. Overall, what I'm looking for are not just good companies, they're genuine compounding machines. Now, different people can define a compounding machine their own way. By my definition, a compounding machine is the ultimate investment. It is almost the perfect investment. It's what you could imagine in your mind as being the optimal investment. Imagine investing in a business that's super profitable, faces little competition, has a long, durable runway of uninterrupted organic growth, can return nearly all of its cash flows back to the owners, and it's perpetually undervalued. That is overall the perfect investment. That is a compounding machine. And the truth is there's less of them than you think. Compounders are rare, but finding them can make a world of difference to your portfolio. One single compounding machine can make up for numerous failed bets. You can lose money on companies left and right. And if you own a compounding machine and you hold it long term, that can overall reshape your portfolio into a winning strategy. We've seen this with great investors all throughout history. We can go back as far as Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham is considered the father of value investing. He taught Warren Buffett. He wrote the Holy Bible of value investing, which is the intelligent investor. Now out of Benjamin's strategy, which he outlines in the intelligent investor, He says to buy cheap companies, to buy undervalued companies, to buy companies that are below book value. But an observation over Benjamin Graham's life shows that the majority of his gains, in fact, the huge majority came from a single compounding machine. 
that company's Geico. So despite his teachings, he had most of his growth from this compounding machine. Phil Fisher was another older investor that made this observation very early. He wrote about high quality companies. He acknowledged that in order to have astounding gains, you need to hold compounding machines in your portfolio long term. Warren Buffett was another investor. Talked about as a value investor, but if you really looked at the holdings that made a difference to his portfolio, it was the qualities of the company. And Buffett stressing that overall a wonderful company, a compounding machine, is what drives good results over time. He's held many of them in his portfolio. Seas Candy, Geico, American Express, Coca-Cola, Apple, to name a few. We move on to more modern, younger investors. Terry Smith, the high-quality investor that's also outperformed, has outperformed largely due to a couple compounding machines in Microsoft and Domino's. Chuck Ockrey has seen Alpha through holding MasterCard and Moody's. You can study all these great investors over time and look at where their gains really came from. They mostly came from a few astounding companies that held these characteristics. So I view it as my opportunity as an investor to identify these compounding machines today, get them in my portfolio, and hold them long term. And that brings me back to today with my decision to buy Moody's. I believe Moody's is a genuine compounding machine. I do not believe this company lowers the overall quality of my portfolio. In fact, I believe adding it to my portfolio as an additional holding increases the overall quality, moat, and earnings potential of my portfolio. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the characteristics of Moody's. To first understand Moody's, the company's basically broken up into two halves, each part making up 50% of the revenue. The first half of it is called Moody's Investor Services. That's what they call Moody's as you understand it. Moody's is a credit rating agency, which means that they rate the credit worthiness of many companies, in fact, thousands of them across the globe. The credit rating business is an incredibly concentrated industry that faces very little competition. You have S&P Global that has around 40% of the market, Moody's that has around 40% of the market, and then the only real big third player is Fitch with around a 15% market share. This has been the same market share for over a decade. These companies have kept their market share despite many attempts from the government to try to increase competition through various acts, various means. The truth is that it's very difficult to uproot Moody's, S&P Global, and Fitch as the market share leader in the credit rating agency market. The reason being is because it's incredibly difficult to disrupt a language protocol effect. Everyone in the market and every company knows the language of S&P Global and Moody's. They've been the standard for such a long period of time that introducing a new standard is very difficult and in most cases, very unlikely. This concentrated industry dominated by a couple of companies creates this effect where they have incredible economics. First of all, a lot of this is described as transactional, meaning that Moody's will transact and rate a company's debt once, but that's not where it ends. Moody's continues to rate their debt on an ongoing basis. This is more of subscription revenue. It's recurring revenue. They have 48% of this in corporate finance, around 14% in structured finance, 19% in financial institutions, and 17% in public project infrastructure and finance. They rate all forms of debt all across the globe. And this company is not in just the US. It is a global standard. Being a globally understood and used standard makes it even more difficult to disrupt than if it it were a smaller regional standard. Now Moody's on their investor presentation makes this look astoundingly dull. They have a couple charts and graphs. It doesn't really tell you a whole lot about the company except for some of the basic information. But don't be fooled by the boring presentation. There's nothing boring about being insanely profitable. And the investor services portion of Moody's, this credit rating portion, is insanely profitable. They have adjusted operating margins of 55% in 2023. That's off of revenue of $2.7 billion. So this half of the company has incredibly high margins. Now, along with this part of the business being highly profitable with very high margins, very little CapEx to run this portion of the business, you also have organic growth. This means a lot of growth without a lot of acquisitions. You have economic expansion, which is around 2 to 3%. You have the additional value proposition, which is a euphemism for raising prices around 3 to 4% per year. Then you have the developing capital markets, which they grow into around 1 to 2% per year. All of this combined and you get a fast growing organic double digit revenue growth. Now this is where some confusion comes into play. So I want to highlight something here again. The reason that Moody's has such a substantial moat, the reason it's so difficult to compete with them is because they are a common language for credit ratings. They are embedded in the global economies. Every single company uses them and that creates trust 
brand recognition, and a normalcy, which is very difficult to disrupt. But the other portion of this is the price increases that Moody's able to enact over a long period of time. If we want to find the compounding machine, the perfect investment, that has little competition, which Moody's does, has a long durable runway of uninterrupted organic growth, which Moody's does, we also need the company to be able to have uninterrupted price increases. So how does Moody's accomplish this? Well, Moody's is kind enough to give us an example of their pricing power and what creates so much value with their credit rating business. They say, for example, if a company, just a random company in the market, wants to issue a five-year, $500 million corporate bond, that's something that's routine. It's common for companies to do this. If the bond is rated by Moody's, the interest rate would be 5.55%. If the bond is not rated by Moody's, it'll have a higher interest rate, around 6.2%. The annual interest payments not rated would be 31,000. The annual interest payments rated would be 27,000. So by saving a little bit of money by not getting your bonds rated by Moody's, it actually costs you over $16 million in extra interest by not getting it rated. And this is the reason that every company gets their bonds rated by Moody's and S&P Global. Having access to the credit markets is incredibly important. Getting the lowest interest rate is incredibly important. And companies save an extraordinary amount of money by getting their debt rated by Moody's and S&P Global. When they try to go to third-party unknown companies outside of Moody's and S&P Global, their interest payments on that debt always ends up higher because most corporations are not willing to invest in debt that is unrated by Moody's and S&P Global. So right here, we lay out an illustration of the immense pricing power this portion of the business continues to have. As their network effect grows, as this global standard of credit rating grows throughout all of planet Earth, this value proposition becomes bigger and bigger. Moody's Investor Services, this entire credit rating portion of the business, is a fantastic business. And that is part of the reason why I also invested in S&P Global. These companies each share this wonderful duopoly, where they have virtually global control over credit issuance. This is a wide moat, deeply concentrated industry that faces little competition. So for about half of Moody's business, you have an excellent business that meets all of the qualifications of a compounding machine. Now, Moody's could have just ended things there. They could have ran their investor service business and done credit ratings, but they realized that they had a unique advantage with the amount of data that they were gathering. In 2007 is when Moody's decided to release a new product. This new subsidiary is called Moody's Analytics. Now, because Moody's Investor Services grew so big and it had so much proprietary data, they thought that they could repackage this data, they could gain additional insights, and they could create an analytics platform, a software platform with all of this key data, and they could sell that to other companies. That is the basis of Moody's Analytics. It's decision-making tools and insights based off of all of the proprietary data that Moody's already had. Now, over the years, since 2007, they've bolstered their offering by acquiring a series of smaller companies to add additional insights and analytics like other companies have. So now they have a huge breadth of data to be able to offer companies to help them make decisions. Now, a couple key things I'd highlight about Moody's Analytics. This is different than if a company just buys another company. Moody's corporation creating their Moody's analytics is an entirely different situation where they're leveraging an existing part of their business where they already own a ton of proprietary data and they use that data to aid in this new analytics platform. So they're leveraging an existing part of their business to benefit another part of their business. This is one of the few cases where you actually have synergy, where you create both a moat, high margins, and a great product for other companies. And the more I learned about Moody's Analytics, the more I really like this aspect of their business. A lot of people just focus on the credit rating business, but I think Moody's Analytics is actually really good. They highlight here the unique moat that Moody's Analytics has over other analytic platforms. It's extensive, uniquely curated proprietary data meaning they know things about companies that other companies do not know, so they can leverage that knowledge. Another aspect I like about this business is you know how much I like subscription businesses. I love having that reoccurring income that's on repeat either every month or every single year. Moody's has this with their analytics platform. The retention rate is above 90%. A 90% retention rate is really good. That's in the same realm as Costco and Amazon Prime in terms of retention. So that's in the elite category of retention rates. The analytics portion of the company does not have as high of margins as the credit rate business, but it does still have incredibly impressive margins with 33.6% operating margins. And then one incredibly impressive statistic that they highlight
highlight is that this portion of the business, Moody's Analytics, is so predictable, has such a high retention rate, they have so much pricing power with it that it's grown by 63 quarters in a row. 63 consecutive quarters of growth. So this is a high margin, continually growing, sticky business. Their customer base is incredibly diverse across different organizations. You have insurance companies, commercial banks, real estate entities, professional services, educational institutions, asset managers, government entities, so on and so forth. All in all, they have over 15,000 customers with that 90% retention rate. And around 70% of the Fortune 100 is currently using Moody's Analytics. So to summarize Moody's, you have part of the Company, roughly half of it that's Moody's Investor Services, a very wide moat concentrated industry of credit rating businesses where it's a language for companies to use credit worthiness. This portion of the company has very high margins and organic revenue growth. The other half of the company is Moody's Analytics. This is a fast growing, highly profitable subscription business with over 90% retention. So combined, overall, you have two very attractive businesses under the name Moody's. So that's what the company looks like from a qualitative perspective. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the actual details here with their finances. For this, we're gonna be using Qualtrim. This is a website that's included as part of the Patreon membership. You can try this out for free with a link in the description below. But let's go ahead and take a look at the revenue here. Moody's revenue grows around 7 to 12 percent per year and it's done so for a very long period of time. It's seen a recent slowdown over the past year or so because interest rates rapidly increased causing a lot of companies to stop issuing debt but that is looked at as a temporary phenomenon. Eventually companies will raise debt in line with their historical average. That debt needs to be rated, which will cause Moody's revenue to go back up. And the Moody's analytics platform also continues to grow at a steady seven to 10% rate per year. If we look at this on an annual basis, the future estimates for Moody's are that they can grow revenue around nine to 10% per year for the next few years. So analysts are expecting very similar growth to what we've seen over its history. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how this revenue translates into margins, the profitability of this business. Their gross margins hovers right Right around 70%. I expect that to remain mostly the same. The operating margins have been anywhere from 34% to 45%. Their operating margins should continue around 45% in the future, and they should increase over time as the credit rating business recovers. This company translates around 30% of its revenues or more into profits. That is an insanely profitable company. Moody's achieves this high margins by having an incredibly efficient business. They have low expenses. Their capex last year was $283 million with over $5.5 billion in revenue. So this is a company that really has a small proportion of their revenue go to CapEx. Now, if we bring up the balance sheet of Moody's, this also looks fine. They do have more debt than cash, which I always have a preference for companies having a low amount of debt. Moody's does have some debt, but it is very low compared to their EBITDA or their cash flows. They could pay off their net debt within two years, which means that in and of themselves, they're a very credit worthy company. Now that we've looked a little bit about what the company does, about the financials, I wanna take a look at the valuation of the company. This is a cause of concern for a lot of investors in companies like Moody's. They rarely trade for cheap. Right now, Moody's trades at a 33 Ford PE ratio, which I know right off the bat is going to cause a lot of you to believe this company's overpriced or that it's priced for perfection. I don't believe that's the case. The P.E. ratio is only one metric that should be used in conjunction with the rest of the company's expectations. So we have the P.E. ratio. If we look at the free cash flow yield, the company's trading at around 2.5%. Here's what Moody's free cash flow looks like over its long-term history. This is since 1988. So we can see that there is moderate growth and then it pulls back at certain times and continues growing. Now, the free cash flow has hit a peak in 2020 of 2 billion. 2021, it went down a little bit. And then in 2022, as interest rates went up, as companies became very conservative, the free cash flow plummeted along with the credit rating business. But again, this is a one-time event and we can already see the credit markets recovering. If we break this down in the quarterly, you can see the recovery over the past couple of quarters. If we look at last year, once Moody's reports its next quarter, we'll have the final quarter for last year. And it's going to be around 1.8 billion dollars in free cash flow. So the orange bar in 2023 should be right around there, 1.8 billion dollars. I believe on 2024, this company will earn over $2 billion in free cash flow. So this year, I believe they're going to earn another additional incremental $200 million in free cash flow, putting it at or above its all-time high. With a current market cap of $68 billion and an expected 
$2 billion of free cash flow in 2024. That puts the current free cash flow yield of Moody's today, based on this year's free cash flow, at roughly 3%. So the company's trading at a 3% free cash flow yield. At a current 3% free cash flow yield, I think there's going to be people that say that Moody's isn't worth the time or that it's too expensive. And I think that's fine if you believe that. But when I look at history, again, looking at all the great investors and what really led to their returns, whether it was Benjamin Graham, Phil Fisher, Warren Buffett, Terry Smith, they had these great returns by owning a few great companies and owning them for a long, long period of time. Moody's is one of these corporations that's always seemed more expensive than it actually is. It's always a company that isn't looked at as exciting or one that's flashy enough for investors to hold. So this company has been perpetually undervalued for a long period of time. So I'm happy to have it as part of the portfolio, and I plan on starting with this $5,000 position and adding to it all throughout the year. Eventually, I want to grow it into a fifty dollars or $60,000 position. It's going to take a while to get there, but this is just the start. Now, moving on, I'm sure you've all heard the news of the Boeing plane that had a door, or what at least looks like a door, fall off the plane early in the flight but it was during the actual flight. There's video that people took showing an entire section of the plane missing. They're in the middle of the sky and they have this huge section missing. Now, luckily for Boeing and the passengers, there was nobody sitting at that seat. That's a miracle that no one happened to be sitting there. Very lucky for the passengers, very lucky for Boeing. If someone was sitting there, they could have been sucked out of a plane and fallen to their death, which is one of the most frightening things to conceive of. Now, of course, after this, they ran a little investigation trying to see if everything was bolted on correctly in these planes. Boeing shares fell quite a bit after it was discovered that Alaska Air and United Airlines had said they have discovered loose parts on the 737 MAX. Now, they actually did the right decision here. Last time that Boeing had a problem where one of their planes crashed, they kept flying the planes. They inspected the one that crashed and said, oh no, we have no real issue here that's a problem with other planes. They completely swept it under the rug. They tried to ignore it. But in this case, at least they're grounding the other potential planes that may have this issue. They've grounded 170 of these planes. So they're not flying right now. If you're a passenger on an airplane, you're not flying on the same model of the one that's had this problem. I think ultimately what we see here is a problem with Boeing's culture, a problem that I saw a long time ago. When I was investigating the MCAS system, reading all the reports of it, reading firsthand from the engineers and pilots and what they had to say around it, it illustrated that Boeing had a massive problem with their culture, pushing profits over safety, cutting corners, only doing the minimum of what the regulators would require. And that led to devastating consequences. And I believe that that same culture hasn't been entirely changed. If the CEO is gonna make any substantial change here to Boeing, it's not gonna be to fix these planes in and of themselves. It's gonna be to change the entire culture of Boeing. Focus on going far above and beyond what the regulators require. Because the more this type of stuff happens, the more it endangers passengers and gives Boeing a reputational black eye. Now, there was an interesting question posed by one of the brilliant minds at Wall Street Bets. We know that that's one of the best places to get financial advice. You go to Wall Street Bets and they will try to make money on anything. He poses the question, is it insider trading if I bought Boeing puts while I'm inside the wrecked plane? Purely hypothetical, of course. Imagine sitting on an airplane when suddenly the door blows out. Now, while everyone else is screaming and grasping for air, you instead turn your noise-canceling headphones on to ignore the crying baby next to you. You calmly open your Robinhood account, or whatever broker you prefer, and you load up on Boeing puts. There is no way the market could have ever priced that in. It is literally just happening. Would that be considered insider trading? I mean, you're literally inside the wreck of an airplane. On the other hand, one could argue that you're outside of the airplane given that the door just blew off. Now this hypothetical, as crazy as it sounds, could have actually happened. Anyone could have brought out their phones and they could have bet against Boeing while on that flight during the wrecked plane. And this is entirely legal. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, so I can't say for certainty, but from everything that I know, there is nothing to legally preclude you from betting against a company because you see something firsthand happen negatively with that company, even if it's information that other people don't have quite yet. The only rules for insider trading are really if you're an executive or you have an insider position at the company. You know the financials, you know what the next quarterly report's gonna be, you know when future products are gonna be released. But having first-hand knowledge of a company because you are experiencing something with it, 
whether that's a plane that's wrecking, that gives you no legal limitation from making a bet based on those experiences. So to answer this Wall Street Bets post here, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see anything illegal about this. Now moving on, we have some news coming out of the EV category. Honda went to CES in Vegas and they released some new concept cars, one of them called the Space Hub and the other called the Saloon. This is what the Saloon looks like. Now obviously this design is catching a lot of attention because it looks pretty interesting. This is a uniquely designed car, specifically the back part of it. You have kind of this mouth part of the back where it opens up and that actually looks like it's going to be an LCD or some type of display. The front of the vehicle has the same type of feature, but instead of being tilted upwards, it's tilted downwards. It has two lights closer to the windshield and then it has the front open part with the Honda logo and it looks again like some type of display, like a TV or an iPad, where you can actually see particles moving around as the display changes. The actual prototype of the car on stage also looks pretty cool. It's all blacked out, it's glossy, it has huge rims, and it looks very sleek. The other EV concept they showed off was called the Space Hub, and it looks more like a big transportation vehicle, more like a futuristic van. The vehicle looks bigger, more blocky, a bit more spacious. It looks like it has a huge viewing range. It's almost all glass, all viewing on the top of the vehicle, and it looks overall very futuristic, which fits into their Space Hub theme. Now they haven't released the stats on these vehicles, they're still in their concept mode, but we do know that they're going for autonomous driving capabilities. They say that the steering yoke is able to retract into the dashboard for each vehicle. So they're building these with the intention of them being autonomously driving. The next generation AD system is being developed based on Honda's human-centric safety approach. It'll feature advanced AI sensing, recognition, driver monitoring technologies to achieve a more human-like natural and high-precision risk predictions, making it possible to offer the automated driving features people can feel safe and confident in using. Okay, so that's some big claims from Honda. They're creating two new futuristic vehicles that they believe they can have self-driving safely in a human-centric way. They're going to deploy it in Japan first and then the rest of the world later. Even though Honda is a huge company with enormous resources, I remain skeptical at their ability to create an EV that is truly autonomous. So we'll have to wait and see. That's all for this episode. If you want more content, you can check out my other YouTube channel, the Joseph Carlson After Hours Show, or you can join the Patreon and see exclusive episodes. That's all for now. See you in the next one.